uh, going to be an interesting presentation. You probably had a look at Andrew's uh, bio. He started out as a mineral and engineering geologist. Probably wasn't uh, very exciting, so he switched to IT and telecoms in sales and marketing. Uh, he's a sailor, uh, James Craig, and had a catamaran, uh, and he's a speaker at the museum, which is, we've got a couple of people here. Ron's a speaker at the museum, myself. Uh, so uh, he's overall uh, a really good bloke. Uh, I could be a bit biased here. Uh, he and I have worked together for quite some years. So uh, over to you, uh, Andrew. Okay, uh, the early French maritime exploration of Nouvelle Hollande, including Terre Napoleon. Um, and as you can see down the bottom, our, brave, our debt to these brave men, and the asterisk is to remind me to make sure I mention to you that perhaps there are two women involved. Um, here it says, as we say, well, you could easily have been a French colony, but there are a few things that, that didn't happen, and that's we'll explain. It. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, they say the victors write the history. The goals of today's talk, are, you can, uh, as you can see, are to challenge what may be our preconceived ideas about the French and their abilities, to acknowledge the often overlooked contribution of the early French Republic and the French Kingdom uh, to our knowledge of Australia's geography, flora and fauna, and to learn a little about these guys and what they've done, to understand how competent they were in the framework of the, of the turmoil going on back in La Belle France at the time and what this did to them. Uh, it is not to improve our schoolgirl or schoolboy French, to which I'm sure we're grateful. I certainly am. Okay, what if I told you the first European to step on Australian soil could have been a Frenchman? And I'll talk about that in a minute or two. 266 years before Cook. What if I told you that the first complete map of our mighty continent was actually published by a Frenchman, not Flinders? What if I told you that Napoleon was a hair's breadth from coming to Australia, but would have definitely died on that voyage? And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But just imagine what Europe would have been like without Napoleon. It, it, one wonders. What if I told you that the French claimed the West Coast for France before the English? And the East Coast, but after Cook. At this stage, it, people were unsure whether Australia's West Coast and East Coast were joined. So it was legitimate claim in that sense. So what if I told you it was the French who in so doing, the first people to show were a single landmass. What if I told you that today, in the 21st century, some of the scientific information collected by the French and acquired in the early 19th century is still used? That was the quality of the information. Uh, there are over 250 French place names in WA alone and lots more in Tasmania and elsewhere in uh, Nouvelle Hollande. There were six, uh, six is an in inverted commas, because one of them is a little bit dodgy, and we'll talk about that as well. But there were six major French expeditions to Australia um, up to the early 19th century. We'll look at each one briefly. Jean Bonnoir, Paul Maire de Gonville, Marc Joseph Marion de Foin, Louis Francois Marie Alneau de Saint Alorin, Jean Francois de Galup, Comte de La Pareuse, Antoine Raymond Joseph de Bruni d'Entre Castel, and Nick Borden. I feel sorry for Nicholas Thomas Borden for a number of reasons. Uh, not the least of which Nicholas Thomas Bourdain name doesn't quite have the same uh, panache as the other chaps, but I think you'll find, or in my view, Bourdain is unfairly treated and has really done some had done some neat stuff. So uh, I look forward to finishing up with him. Now I don't think I need to show most of you, ladies and gentlemen, this this vessel, uh, this picture. But when I talk to Probus clubs, U three A's, and so on, um, I don't think people have an idea of the size of the vessels that these remarkable people went to sea in and sailed around the world. So I put this picture up to just illustrate that this was no holiday cruise that these guys went on around the world in, in you know, 200 and something years ago, 300 years ago. Um, so I shall move on from that. So why do we not parler français? Well, I guess we need a little history um, and we will look at that. But first, I guess the question is, why did it go pear-shaped? Uh, and the reason is the same as it is today and always has been politics, um, as well as death. The, the French commanders had a habit of dying. Having been to Australia, I don't know was it was about Australia that killed them, but, but they would die before they got back to France and could claim the, the success they had. There was a fair bit of bad judgment thrown in, a bit of bad luck. Um, and as you can imagine, um, during the revolution, the, um, the turmoil that existed, and these ships were a microcosm of that turmoil, 
there, there was you know royalists versus um, uh, revolutionaries, and again we'll talk about that as we go through. Um, I've got the word enlightenment there. Enlightenment was the term used at the time for natural philosophy or what we call science. And I think it's fair to say that the French explorers exhibited a greater degree of enlightenment, a little bit of liberté, uh, qualité and fraternité, um, and more so than I think the Brits did. And I'm taking a fairly broad brush when I say that. But I do it deliberately because I think the pendulum has been too far the other way. Um, the science that the French brought to bear on these trips was was really very, very solid and, and very impressive. And again, we'll talk about that. But many of the specimens were collected by the French in times of war with the British. But there were passports issued and, and uh, the allowance of these people to do exactly those sorts of things. And of course, there's the Liberty guiding the people, a famous picture, just to illustrate the turmoil at the time. We'll start with Jean Benoit Palmier de Gonville. Um, as you can see, born in Normandy, sailed from Honfleur in a ship called the Hope. He rounded Cape of Good, uh, Good Hope. He was had dreadful storms. He was becalmed, and they, for some ages, they followed some birds and found up what they called a fine river. They were there for six months, interacting with the local people with no problems. He called it the Southern Indies. The French have always referred to it as Gonville land. So when was Gonville land discovered? 1504, ladies and gentlemen, a long, long time ago. So where was he? Well, people say Madagascar, people say Brazil, or northwestern Australia. The description in his documents bear a very strong resemblance to the area around the Prince, uh, the Prince Regent River area. So it, it's speculation, of course, but it could well have been northwestern Australia. Now, how do we know this? And this is, a, this is the interesting bit. The journal was captured by English privateers, that the ship was raided by the English privateers on their way home. Their journals were confiscated by the privateers. But a deposition of the Admiralty Court of Normandy signed by uh, Gonville and all his officers explained what they'd learned and what they, they'd remembered and bits and pieces they already had. Some hundred years later, or 150 years later, it resurfaces with a declaration to Pope Alexander VII from a monk a hundred years after that, well, it was published in French, um, first by a philosopher called Charles, Charles de Brosse. Um, but again, sometime later, it was published in English by a Scottish geographer. It gets convoluted by the name of Colander. And it was published in English, Terra Australis Cognita. Importantly, Cognita, not Incognita, because the great southern continent had been found, according to to Monsieur Gonville, Monsieur Le Capitaine Gonville. How do we know? Well, Captain King, Lieutenant Gray in 1838, find European-like faces carved in hard rock. Um, I come back to my geology here, hard igneous or metamorphic rock that, that could only have been carved using iron tools. So the speculation is someone carved those who was European and had, had iron tools. Now, you see, I've, I've crossed out unique cave paintings representing European saints. You will read in some places about the Wanjina figures that appear to have halos. And the argument was those halos were a reflection of the, the saints that they would have carried on board these ships in, in 1504. Um, not, not true. I mean, it's, it's been refuted quite seriously by serious academics that um, this has been doing up to thousands of years. However, the indigenous people tell stories of strangely dressed men, men dressed in turtle shells and crocodile skins. So one wonders if that therefore could not have been um, armour. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first European to step on Australian soil could have been a Frenchman. And I have underlined could because it's a, a bit of a long bow, but what the hell, it's a good story, I think. Let me move on to Marc Joseph Marion de Foyne. He was born in Brittany, if you can see. Um, his task was re to return a native man to Tahiti, then explore the southern seas. The native man was Aotou, who um, was taken back to France by Bougainville when he was in Tahiti, obviously. Um, Aotou was a bit of a character. He would um, enjoy the opera particularly. And when the French chipped him for not speaking good French, he chipped them back for not speaking good Tahitian. Um, so he seems to have been a bit of a character, but he met the king and and was very much part of that upper upper, upper echelon of society in, in Paris. But he petitioned the king to be returned home and the king 
allowed that to happen. He ended up in Ile de France. And I will refer to Ile de France throughout this talk, ladies and gentlemen. Ile de France we know today is Mauritius. So the two phrase, the two names, Ile de France and Mauritius, are the same thing. Um, so uh, Dufresne decides to fund this thing essentially himself. He leaves with two ships, um, the Marquis de Cassier and Marsan, as you can see. Unfortunately, there was an outbreak of smallpox in Madagascar and Aoturu died. Uh, un undeterred, um, he set off into the Pacific to continue his exploration. He sighted Van Diemen's Land on the 3rd of March and landed two days later at Marion Bay and took possession for France on the 5th of March, 1772. He took possession just in a very similar place to where the Dutch had taken it um, 129 years before. Um, they were the first Europeans to act with it, interact with the Tasmanian and Aboriginals. Um, what had happened previously was the Dutch had seen the smoke, but had never seen any of the people. But uh, Dufresne and his people interacted with them. Um, <clears throat> I think this was the one where, to make them feel comfortable, some of the officers and the men went ashore stark naked because all the local people were stark naked to try and woo, uh, get some confidence in what was going on. It went pretty well for the first couple of, uh, of boatloads of, of Frenchmen to come ashore. After that, uh, it got a bit unpleasant. Uh, a fellow was speared and there were shots fired. Um, but they did certainly interact with these people. So what happened to Dufresne from there? Well, he sailed on to New Zealand and he and 24 of his crew were killed and eaten by the Maori. And we know that from the um, journal uh, of the 2IC, uh, a guy called Julien Clouseau, the Nouveau Voyage à la Mer du Sud, New Voyage to the South Sea. Um, and this is where he explained exactly what happened. Um, and that's how Marion de Foyer met his end. Louis Ernaud de saint Erlochin. He was the 2IC of his expedition under um, Yves Joseph de Cregulin. And uh, the king had announced that. Uh, Alain saint Alain was particularly fortunate because he was from a family of old nobility, which stood him in extra good stead. Uh, he shipped the Gross Venture, Big Belly, uh, sailed into Shark Bay on the 29th of March, 1772. His goal was to discover um, France Australie, as they called it. He and Craigillan set off together. Craigillan um, found a, a landfall in the, the southern, uh, southern Ocean and returned to France without saint Alain to announce that he'd found France, Australia, as discovered, as instructed. It turned out it was a barren island now called Craigillan Island in the, in the southern Indian Ocean. But as I say, um, saint Alain sailed into Shark Bay on the 29th of March, 1772. And on the 30th of March, he claimed possession of the West Coast for France and King Louis. It was before the revolution, clearly. And, the Fran and interestingly, the British claimed it in 1829. Again, what it was unknown as to where the, the east and the west coast were linked. We'll come back to that. So how does one claim a country or land? Well, one does it by a flag, a volley and a proclamation. So they buried a bottle with two coins of six franc coins. Why they were six franc coins is beyond my comprehension. But nonetheless, um, they buried this, um, these two coins um, and then sailed back to Ile de France where poor old saint Alain dies of... Um, scurvy, I think, at age 35. However, interestingly, in 1998, one and two, it depends which documents you read, one of these silver écu bearing the head of Louis XV dated 1776, sorry, 1766, was found inside a lead, lead capture on the top of, uh, of the cliff. So this has been authenticated. The, the archaeological expedition was led by Philip Philippe Goddard and Max Kramer, um, and they actually found the, this, this coin. So when saint Laurent says he was there, he was there. Now, Jean-Francois de Gallu, Comte de La Perouse, or La Perouse as we know him. This man captured the imagination of the French, uh, even today. Um, it was a, a celebration of French achievement in the Pacific, although, as we all know, it didn't end too well. But nonetheless, um, 
He was born in Albion, in France. He died in Vancouver, Vinicolou. Um, the French wanted to build on Cook's work in the Pacific. They'd seen what, what Cook had done and what the, the Admiralty referred to as the Spanish Lake and really wanted more of this action himself, uh, themselves. So they sent, um, they sent him in to, to have a look and see what he could find. And Louis the Sixteenth himself helped draft their orders. Uh, and as I alluded to earlier, a young artillery officer applied to go and was rejected as he was too young, and his name was Napoleon Bonaparte. If he had gone, he would have died. I wonder what would have happened. It's a, it's a bottle of red discussion, really. But he, he left uh, left France on the from Brest on the 1st of August, 1785, on two ships, La Bosola and Australab, with 225 men. And here's the famous painting of Louis the 16th, giving his instructions to La Perouse. Um, all looking very flash there. And here's the voyage. It's quite a journey, as you can see. They went into Chile for a refit, then the Sandwich Isles in Alaska, down to California, Korea, and at Kamchatka, two other things happened, and I will, I'll come back to that in, in a moment. But there's a subtext to this diagram, ladies and gentlemen, and the subtext is for most of us with a... Anglo-Saxon background, especially with a naval tradition, uh, the thought of French naval achievement is something that we probably sniggered at as, as young people. Um, I'm here to tell you that's not a reasonable supposition. And as you can see from that chart or that, that track that La Perouse sailed, um, it was an achievement. It was on par with any exploration of the time I would say not on par with Cook, but Cook was a, uh, an outstanding individual, so that's unfair. This, but this is a, a world-class journey uh, uh, by a, a French, a highly accomplished French sailor and crew. So we get to Kamchatka, ladies and gentlemen. Two things happen in Kamchatka. A young man, Bartholomew Lasseps, is sent overland with all the information they'd gathered to date um, back to Paris. It took him 12 months to get back to Paris and he was hailed as a hero when he arrived with all the information that the French had, had collected on this trip. So the other thing they found out is those pesky British had set up a colony at Botany Bay. So as you can see from the diagram from Cam Ch from Kamchatka here, he beetled down via um, so uh, Samoa and Norfolk Island to Botany Bay. Philip is in Sydney at this stage, um, but King... Uh, on the Cirrus is still in Botany Bay. And they arrive on January the 26th, 1788, an auspicious day. Philip is in Sydney Cove, as I say, King's in Botany Bay. King uh, was a fluent French speaker and they stayed six weeks camped ashore. They did um, unfortunately have to bury uh, a, a Franciscan friar who died of his injuries that he'd received in Samoa. There were 12 men killed um, in a battle in Samoa. The relations were good with the English, but the English were somewhat wary, as you can imagine. Philip allowed him to send his dispatches and his plans back to France. So we have a pretty solid idea, because they were read, of what they'd planned to do. And that was to go into the Pacific and, and learn more about it. It was a high-quality scientific expedition with quality output. They had some botanists, they had hydrographers, they even had a gardener. They produced some high-quality charts. Um, their notes say they you know, weren't that impressed with New South Wales in terms of what it had to offer, but uh, they left Botany Bay on the 10th of March, 1788, and were never heard from again. They immediately suspected British foul play, of course, um, and it is rumoured that there's a Louis on the way to the to meet Madame la Guillotine. Um, it, it's rumoured that Louis, some of Louis' last words were, any news of Monsieur La Perouse? I would suggest he had other things on his mind, nonetheless. However, um, Dermot Deville finds this wreckage at Vanakaroo and confirms the Irish captain Peter Dillon's 1826 discoveries of this is exactly what had happened. They were wrecked. And here are the relics from Lasclove and La Boussole that were dug up from or rescued from the, the area. What happened to them? Well, it's a really interesting tale. Um, the story goes that they came ashore the local people say they came ashore, they built a stockade and they built a small two-masted ship from the wreckage of the two ships and from wood from the, the forests nearby and they sailed away. Never to be heard from again, again, if I can use that expression. However, 
there appears to have been another survivor. And what we understand from that was that this article came from an Indian newspaper in 1818, where an Indian sailor had been rescued um, after four years in an, on an island in the, in the Torres Strait. And he tells people that the local, he, he, sorry, he had seen swords and muskets on these islands differently made from the English. So it was suspected, uh, and a gold watch and a compass. So it was suspected that these things were from the, the small two-masted ship that they were wrecked again, the poor gliders. They came ashore, there was fighting, most of them were killed, except one boy. And the boy's name was probably Francois Model, because there was a ship's boy on board. He ended up in another island, and the Murray Islanders showed this Indian fellow the young castaway's clothing and cried as they recalled how he, the last surviving member of these two ships, had left the island and being French, he took two young women with him um, in a canoe and was never seen again. So here are three. The original ships are wrecked. The small two-masted ship is wrecked. Men are killed. And the sole survivor, this boy, is killed also by the ocean eventually. I mean, what a story. No wonder it's captured the imagination of the French and the Australians for that matter. Let me move on to Antoine Raymond Joseph de Bruni d'Entrecasteaux. What a name. Um, he was born in Aix-en-Provence. He died of scurvy in 1793. He wanted to be a priest. He wanted to be a Jesuit priest. But his father signed him up to the French Navy. Now, his father must have known something because he ended up an admiral. So what happens? In September 1791, the French Assembly, we are now post-revolution, they want to find La Perouse again. As I said earlier, La Perouse had fired the imagination of the French and they wanted to know what the hell had happened to him. So he is to command La Research in Les Bruns, Search in the Hope, and on board is a Monsieur Louis Gaudon as a steward. Well, it turns out that Monsieur Louis Gaudon is in fact Mademoiselle Marie-Louise Victoire Galadon, disguised as a man. She had had a illegitimate baby in France, and the only thing she thought she could do was run away. Anyway, she ended up uh, falling in love with a chap on board. They both died of dysentery in Batavia a few days after each other. So that's a sad story. Anyway, <clears throat> Blanchard-Castro's orders were to go to New Holland from Cape Lewin and search um, search every nook and every cranny and see if you can find La Perouse and go into the islands in the Pacific and look for La Perouse. However, he's replenishing his ship in Cape Town and he hears rumours about natives in the Admiralty Islands wearing French sailors' clothing. It, the rumour was attributed to um, Captain Hunter, the British captain. Uh, he denies it, but he, um, Dontrecasteau decided that wasn't true. It was, was, in fact, fact. So he ignored his orders, went to Van Diemen's Land to replenish and head off into the Pacific to find these, pardon me, these ruins. It had un unintended consequences for Dontrecasteau twice. And they are that in doing this effort, pardon me, he missed the southern coast of Australia because he went straight to Van Diemen's Land, of the southern Australian mainland. Anyway, they arrive in Research Bay. They stay for five weeks. They're highly impressed with Van Diemen's land. They refit, they rest, they replenish, they chart, they collect. Now, the, the charts prove to be excellent quality charts. Um, and they have, again, a lot of scientists on board, um, including hydrographers and um, gardeners. So, again, a lot of scientific effort. Uh, that's just a story of a the Atlas of his name. He heads to Emory Island, South Sea, looking for Ella Cruz. He doesn't find him. He turns to Research Bay via Cape Lewin, but takes a big loop. That picture isn't quite illustrated because they was too far south to see that coast. Uh, he names a number of things en route. He has a habit of calling things after him after himself. You know, Bruni Island, Dr. Castello Channel, etc. Um, but he shelters in Esperance Bay and he has the decency to name it Esperance after the second ship. Um now, there's an excellent relationship with the Indigenous people of Van Diemen's Land. Um, and let me just point out the Jacques Malheur de Motte de Boutille talks about the kindness and gentleness, gentleness which seemed to be the basis of their character, gave to our meetings rather an air of a reunion of friends rather than a meeting of individuals who were quite different in every way. And the botanist, Lab I have trouble with this one, Labdalare, 
we could not walk on the dry grass without slipping every moment, particularly where the ground was sloping. But these good savages, to prevent our falling, took hold of us by the arm and thus supported us. So I give you that as some evidence of the fact that um, these guys seem to have a pretty good relationship with the locals. It was another excellent scientific expedition. Labadaro's Nouvelle Hollande Planet Thingo is the finest floral, floral tribute of Australia or collection of Australia and is still in use today because, of course, they were pristine at the time. Now come to one of my favourite bits of this story. They say it's the victors who write the history. Well, where these guys were camped, they discovered a nice river and they called it Riviere du Nord, the Northern River. And they called it that because it was near them, it was to the north of them and so on. However, about three months later, a British captain, John Hayes, saw the same river and he called it the River Derwent. So, ladies and gentlemen, it should be Riviere du Nord if we're going to use European names because the French discovered it first. But it is the River Derwent, as we all know. There's great trouble brewing on board, as I've alluded to before, royalists versus revolutionaries. On the way back, they land in Surabaya when the, true, the officers learn about the rise of the French Republic. They give the ships to the Dutch so that they won't get to the Republic of France. That's how things, how tight things are. Grant Augusto dies of scurvy as they head north. Um, the journals and collections, I said, they eventually reach Paris. What happens is the remaining officers are on their way back to France with maps and specimens and data on a Dutch ship. In Cape Town, the Frenchmen go ashore and the Dutch ship leaves with the maps and the specimens and all the information, but no Frenchmen. Then that collection is confiscated by a British man of war from the Dutch, but it's returned eventually and the data is published in 1799 mostly by Labadario. It's called a relation de voyage à la recherche de la La Perouse. In other words, search for La Perouse. Now come to Nicholas Thomas Bourdain. Nicholas Thomas Bourdain, in my humble view, was a complete amateur, was unfairly dealt with by history. So we go through this, you'll, you'll, you'll see why, I hope. Um, he um, was... Napoleon took such a dim view of him that he, Napoleon said he would have hanged him if he had got back alive. He's another one who died. Um, and I think that's most unfair, but I suppose Napoleon had his reasons. Um, he died at Ile de France, as you can see. He was the son of a merchant and was a merchant marine officer and a French naval officer twice. Once he was dismissed to give room for an aristocrat. So you can imagine that he was a little miffed. But he enjoyed a reputation of bringing exotic creatures and plants back from exotic places. For example, he bought from Asia and Africa four thousand butterflies, four thousand butterflies, shells, plants, and of all things, a hippopotamus. Now, those of you who have seen the endeavor, where would you put a hippopotamus? But he bought this hippopotamus back to France successfully. Anyway, his orders were, and I will read them out to you because I think it's interesting. Citizen Baudin will ascertain whether or not this country completely new to Europeans, offers unknown species of animals and products interesting to botany and mineralogy. He will make a special search along the mainland coast to discover if there is some large opening to a large river. As I said a couple of times, we weren't sure it was one continent at the stage. But you can see those orders say nothing about taking over places and, and, and claiming it and so on. He leaves in two ships, La Geographie under Bourdain and La Naturaliste under Hamelin. Uh, they leave La Havre a big fanfare because Bourdain has a pretty good reputation. The ships are very different. Um, the Naturalist is very deep, deep drafted. It's not a good exploration ship, but the skipper is, is the skipper on board. Um, Hamelin is a competent skipper, so that's on, it's only the, the ship. There are problems. They arrive in Ile de France, and of his um, 40 sailors and 10 scientists jump ship. He, Bourdain gets a few back. Some officers and some scientists pretend to be sick so they can stay in Ile de France for wine, women, song, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, Bourdain and the revolution and all that sort of stuff was having its, its effect on them. However, they arrive at Cape Naturalist and go ashore, then Geography Bay and collect, including Bourdain's black copper too, as you can see there. The ships separate, they plan to meet at Rottnest Island, but that doesn't happen with Timor. Uh, he heads for the Gulf of Carpentaria and he names things on the way, um, Bonaparte Archipelago, Cape Levique, a beautiful spot. Um, 
the crew are getting restless. Is is he brought out irrational? I mean, they thought the same about Cook on his third voyage. You know, was he ill? Did he have parasites? All those sorts of things. But he, he wasn't acting as you might have thought he would. Uh, meanwhile, Hamlin on Dirk Hartog Island, you can see there I said, what a gentleman. He goes ashore on Dirk Hartog, Dirk Hartog Island and finds Vlaming's plaque, which was left 100 years before, which refers to Hartog's plaque 180 years before that. Hamlin refuses to souvenir it. He regards that as a vandalism, so he remounts it. Interestingly, uh, Louis-Claude Flagenet on his ship, and he was a lieutenant on board board, board and ship, we'll come to him in a minute, had no such scruples when in 1818 he took the plaque, you know, pinched it and took it to the Institute in France. And it wasn't returned to the West Australian Maritime Museum in Fremantle until 1947. Um, anyway, they meet again in Timor and they head to Van Diemen's Land. They do 3,000 kilometres in eight days, which is a hell of a sail, a good sail. From Van Diemen's Land, they head west along the Australian coast of the first Europeans. They meet Flinders in Encounter Bay, as you may be aware. Uh, he he is polite, his behaviour is unusual. He never asked Flinders who he was and what he was doing and why he was there. Um, and, and Flinders recorded that he thought it was odd, but they exchanged information and had some sort of reasonable encounter. They should have been well ahead of Flinders, but um, he tarried too long uh, in, in Tasmania. He was worried about heading west in the winter. Uh, Lieutenant Frasino, uh, Louis Claude Frasino, but was not impressed as he would have beaten the English to mapping the coast of Bourdain if not, if Bourdain had not, quote, kept us so long picking up shells and catching butterflies. By now scurvy's rampant, so they head to Sydney. There are only four men on the ship, sorry, four men capable of running the ship, including the IOD. Governor King is the governor in Sydney town at the time, and he helps him in spite of the severe shortages. Again, he speaks fluent French. He entertains um, Bourdain as best he can. Um, he also entertained... Um, Frazenay, when he was there with Frazenay's wife, who snuck on board. Um, Mary Beckworth, the escaped convict, a 16-year-old convict disguised as a man, comes on board. Uh, Bourdain had planned to put her off on a Dutch or a French island. It's speculated that King knew about it, and he was happy to have one less convict to worry about. Um, and he ends up putting her off in Ile de France. Until that time, she shared Bourdain's cabin, I think in a purely, in a purely platonic sense, ladies and gentlemen. But... Uh, Meanwhile, in Mauritius, Ile-de-France, Flinders is imprisoned. And he is consulted by Bourdain's younger brother, who's the captain of a Danish ship. What the devil to do with this woman? Bourdain has died at this stage, I'm afraid. Um, his younger brother on the Danish ship says, what am I going to do with that? Nothing happens in the record end, so we really don't know what happened to her. Hamelin is sent back to France with the charts and the journals. Trouble is still brewing. The men don't like Bourdain. But I love this bit at the end. Ironically, it is Bourdain who embodies the ideas of the revolution. And let me read this, ladies and gentlemen. This is in a letter that Bourdain wrote to King to thank him for looking after them and really saving their bacon um, by bringing them back to some sort of level of health. To my way of thinking, I have never been able to conceive that there was justice or even fairness on the part of Europeans in seizing in the name of their governments a land seen for the first time when it was inhabited by men who have not always deserved the title of savages or cannibals that has been freely given them. It would be infinitely more glorious for your nation, as for mine, to mould the poor society of the inhabitants of its own country, over whom it has rights, rather than wishing to occupy itself with the improvement of those who are far removed from it. What an enlightened man. And this was the bloke that um, Napoleon was going to hang. Anyway... What a dreadful thing. Okay, Bourdain sails from Sydney town, but dies in Ile France, as we've said. The biologist on board, Francois Perron, disliked Bourdain intensely. He never even referred to him by name in any of his journals. He simply said the commander. Perron, I said amateur spy, and he writes to Declan. Declan is the governor of Ile de France, who Napoleon had promised was going to be the governor of the whole of India when Napoleon took over India. But, of course, Nelson at, uh, at the Battle of the Nile scotched that. So Declan wasn't too happy with the, the French and he was uh, with the English, and that's why he was very happy to keep um, Flinders locked up. Anyway, I digress. Louis-Claude Frasenan is a cartographer. He's in league with Perron. When they're being looked after in Sydney, he makes charts um, as to what they can do and how they can... Um, land here and build an invasion plan. So Perron um, 
writes to declare and says, once the English colony is conquered, it can be easily defended by our troops against any attack with great force. And since the colony has enough substance, it won't starve of hunger because of enemy warships. Thus, it will be strong enough to hold out against British land and sea forces. Further advised they claim the colony should be destroyed as soon as possible. This is a man who is being rescued essentially by the British in Sydney town who have limited supplies themselves. And Perron adds in a postscript that Monsieur Frazenet, the young officer, has especially concerned himself with examining all the points upon the coast of the environs of Port Jackson, which are favourable for the landing of troops. He has collected particular information about the entrance to the port. And if ever the government should think of putting into execution the project of destroying this freshly set trap of a great power, that distinguished officer would be a valuable assistance in such an operation. Now, I'm happy to forgive Frazenet as a military officer. Uh, Perron, I'm a bit less likely to, to forgive him. Let me talk about the science on board. 22 scientists leave France. 10 jump ship in Ile de France. Three, three return to France alive. They collected 18,414 specimens that were collected and sent back to France. 2,542 new animal species, 640 new plant species. I mean, that was a huge success. Bourdain was frustrated with the science. The scientists, it's a new profession. The scientists were not used to the Navy or the harsh conditions. Bourdain remarked on the patience he needed. The science would get lost, delay things. They didn't understand tide, weather, wind. Um, so he had to be fairly patient. He managed them pretty well. But it was a huge success. And in, in my view, one of the most successful forgotten or underrated expeditions, certainly. Let me talk about two gunner's mates, um, a man called... Le Sieur and a man called Petit. Here's Charles Alexandre Le Sieur. He was, Bourdain saw his talent on board as a, as a gunner's mate, as an artist, and used him for his private journal. He produced some 1,500 drawings with Petit of animals, fish, coastal profiles, some of them while at sea. Now, look at the quality of these drawings, ladies and gentlemen. Just, just superb, just superb. 1,500 drawings. Petit mostly did... Um, he collaborated with Perron. So he mostly did people. The poor man died shortly after returning to France, age 27, of gangrene. But look at the quality of these drawings. They're just beautiful. Let me go back, look at this, the blue of these fish and the man of war and, and these pictures. Now, Diana S. Jones, who is the executive director of collections and research at the Museum of Western Australia, says in the Great Circle Journal, Volume 39, number two in 2017, says this about their work. Quote, their drawings and paintings of birds, animals and marine creatures of coastal profiles and of the Aborigines are among the most historically important and beautiful records of 19th century discovery. Now that is some serious accolade. Bourdain, the Empress Josephine and the Garden of Almazon. Josephine loved exotic plants and animals. In fact, there were all sorts of creatures wandering around the garden at Malmaison. And her head gardener, Felix Delhaye, had been the uh, gardener on D'Entrecasteaux's expedition. Like I've mentioned, there were gardeners on these trips. So he was the only man in Europe, the only professional gardener, who'd seen these plants growing in their native habitat. So nine months between the ships arriving, Hamlin arrives first in June 1803 um, and arrives back in France the first ship, La Naturalist, arrives at La Havre in June 1803. Intense rivalry developed between um, Josephine and André Thauvin, the professor of horticulture at Musée d'Histoire Naturelle, for the possession of the cargo. Thauvin was at La Havre to meet the ship and to supervise the unloading of the collections and their transport back to Paris. Determined they should come to Malmaison, however, Josephine persuaded Napoleon to have the Minister of the Interior intervene. On the 13th of June, he wrote to the professors at the museum, politely inviting them to put all the plants that Madame Bonaparte wished to have, put them aside. Uh, good old Andre ignored this request. So it was followed by a second letter stating, and I quote, is in the interest of science and for the glory of France to encourage Madame Bonaparte's distinguished taste. And I invite you to back her aims as well as mine with every means you have at your disposal. As you can imagine, the result of that was that Joseph, uh, Josephine essentially got what she wanted um, of these plants. But but we have plenty left over for fine. The aftermath. The French Navy is defeated at Trafalgar. Napoleon wants a glorious report with maps of the latest French triumph to Neville Holland. So Perron, Perron and Frazier are on the job. Now that drawing, that this one here, 
um, is of Perron, and it was done by Le Sueur 10 days before Perron died of tuberculosis, and that's crazy. Um, Perron died in, of TB in 1810, was well regarded by his work on Australian um, biology and botany. He put together a 400-page manuscript, including 96 of these beautiful plates by Le Sueur, but they were not catalogued and deposited into the Museum de Soie Natural at La Havre until 1980, 170 years later. Just goes to show what the French under Napoleon had on their mind, and it wasn't science. The collection of science was fine, but its deposition and understanding were um, a little bit uh, down the, the scale. Louis Frosinet builds a map. He builds the work on Dutch, the English, and the French. It's published in 1811. And here's the map. And this area down here was to be called Terre Napoleon. Um, Flinders hears about this. He's in prison on Ile, uh, Ile de France. He doesn't, he's not let out of house arrest until 1814. And as you can imagine, he is somewhat unimpressed by this um, and takes rather a dim view, which probably wouldn't have helped his incarceration, but nonetheless. Um, and there's Perron's works. So, ladies and gentlemen, a great series of scientific achievements. The materials collected in these things are still used today as reference points. A greater focus on science than conquest. For example, Flinders in The Investigator had six scientists, Bourdain had 22. Was it an enlightenment or was it circumstances? It must have been a mix of both, clearly. But please be under no mistake. The French explorers made a hugely significant contribution. The understanding and knowledge of this continent, a great cost to them personally, and in a time of great uncertainty at home. We're very fortunate to have this information. And as most of us being good uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon origin people, we send us a French guy. Not true. Major contribution, serious effort, um, and, and a wonderful series of, of, of achievements. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, that's me done. I'm more than happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing um, and I'll hand it back to Doug to see what he wants to do. Thank you.